So let me begin by thanking Peter and Marie-Hélène for organizing this beautiful event. I've learned plenty of new things about uh, Jaina philosophy. And uh, I have the doubtful privilege to probably present you the first uh, conference in, uh, today that is more caused by ignorance than knowledge. Uh, <laughs> I am not uh, uh, an Indologist, uh, neither I'm a Sanskritist, but uh, uh, somehow the, the program is very well done because uh, what I will be talking about may be seen as a kind of appendix to what you just heard uh, and presented the, the Naya very well. And uh, I will just add a, a few comments about <clears throat> what uh, 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 the Nayavada may inspire to someone who's looking at it from the perspective of uh, modern linguistics, <clears throat> and especially from the, the field of the uh, semantic pragmatic, in the, so the so-called semantic pragmatic uh, uh, um, interface. So. Uh, I, I would like to uh, begin with this uh, uh, idea that uh, uh, you find, for instance, in Jivas Jarvi paper, that uh, 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 one of the constituting uh, characteristic of Jain uh, 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 attitude and worldview is that uh, commentary is uh, of particular importance, and uh, retrieving the meaning of, uh, of uh, discourse is uh, uh, particularly uh, complex in the sense that. Uh, uh, you, you not only need lexical, syntactical, and semantic level, but sometimes the meaning is really different of what is explicitly said. So you need uh, special heuristics, you need pragmatics to, uh, to retrieve the meaning of what is said. And then uh, it's been claimed by, uh, uh, especially by Peter, for instance, that uh, uh, you've got, uh, uh, for instance, uh, deep correspondences between uh, Habermas, for instance, universal pragmatics and uh, uh, Jaina philosophy of language. And uh, uh, here I highlight that the subcategories of uh, uh, the explanation of the mode of speech uh, may correspond to uh, the level of empirical semantics and pragmatics. So there is a connection between uh, uh, what uh, the Jaina uh, author in the tradition were doing, uh, doing philosophy of language and what we are doing now uh, in, in empirical uh, uh, or scientific approach to uh, language, natural language phenomena. So the, the idea of the talk is uh, to, 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 to look at the details uh, or to try to look at some details uh, uh, about what in the Jaina philosophy of language echoes what uh, is going on in the contemporary uh, linguistics. So here's the outline of what I will be talking about. Uh, uh, first, I will be, uh, make some comments about what's going on at the interface between uh, semantics and pragmatics now. Uh, then focus on uh, existential presupposition and how they are, they are dealt with in uh, the so-called dynamic semantics. And uh, then I will try to uh, look at the Nayavada from the perspective outlined uh, uh, in the previous sections. And uh, as a preamble, I, I would like to, to put myself into this uh, uh, under the, the authority of uh, uh, style uh, uh, about anachronism, I like this point. So the idea is that uh, if you are looking at uh, Indian astronomy, for instance, what we know uh, about stars is relevant to understand what they are doing. It's not like uh, it's uh, just mere technicalities uh, having to do with what uh, we, we see when you look at the sky. It has to do with the sky, and then if you want to understand Indian traditional astronomy, you have to know something about astronomy. And I think it's the same uh, for, uh, it's, it's, uh, I, I'm aware where it's uh, contentious, but I think it's the same for language analysis, that uh, you need the full-blown uh, uh, linguistics, today linguistics, to understand what, what's going on in giant historical texts, because they are dealing with the basically the same kind of phenomena, I think. So, uh, semantic pragmatic interface. So the first, it's a question of division of labor, and uh, you may, may be uh, aware of the fact that uh, uh, this notion of an interface between semantics and pragmatics uh, 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 it looks really like a, a, a war. Uh, uh, it's uh, who does what in uh, uh, the analysis of meaning, and uh, you've got plenty of different stances about that. But I will uh, just focus on one uh, uh, rather, not 
two controversial point of view about what is the difference between semantics and pragmatics. So you've got Ken Bach uh, saying that uh, first it's about information and semantic information is encoded in what is uttered. These are stable linguistic features of the sentence together with any extra-linguistic extra information that provides semantic value to context-sensitive expression in what is uttered. So the first thing, and this is no fully uncontroversial, is that uh, even in semantics, you've got context sensitivity. You've got the axis, you've got, a, a, you've got a, a, a lot of phenomena that uh, can only be accounted for taking into account context uh, uh, while doing semantics. And then you've got a, a pragmatic information is extra information that arises from an actual act of entrance and is relevant to the here determination of what the speaker is communicating. Whereas semantic information is encoded in what is uttered, pragmatic information is generated by, or at least made relevant by the act of uttering it. So the main div uh, divide is, uh, lies along the, the notion of grammaticalization of something that is uh, a linguistic encoding. And then uh, uh, one of the uh, main consequences of that is that uh, linguistic encoding induces a well-defined set of relevant information. When you look at what is uh, actually said, literally said, or what you look at what is uh, uttered, uh, you, you, you can uh, uh, make an exhaustive list of what is relevant to uh, give semantic value to all the components. While on the other hand, speech acts, uh, when you consider the speech act of entering something and uh, you, you try to uh, analyze what is made relevant by the fact that someone says something in a given situation, you, don't, you won't get a well-defined set of uh, the relevant information. This is why uh, uh, the inference, the, the so-called pragmatic inferences that you use to uh, complete the meaning or to, to, to decipher the meaning of uh, what someone is saying or conveying, uttering something in the given situation, uh, is called free enrichment. enrichment. And free here means that uh, it's unbounded, and you cannot just uh, put a limit to what you can infer from uh, uh, with respect to meaning of what someone is saying in a given uh, circumstance. So uh, you've got this phenomenon that is no uh, uh, um, also uncontroversial that uh, you uh, in dealing with natural language practices you've got the uh, pragmatic intrusion, what Levinson called. Uh, pragmatic intrusion, and it's uh, an extremely commonplace phenomenon. It's the idea that uh, 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 the truth condition of what is said, to use uh, Grice's phrase, truth condition of what is said are underdetermined by uh, uh, pragmatically inferred content. So you've got uh, the, the, the very idea and the contextual framework in which I'm working is that the, uh, you cannot divide, you cannot separate uh, semantics and pragmatics. Uh, there's no way to do that because, because pragmatics is uh, involved in the de determination of semantic content, uh, of semantic content, and obviously semantic content will be the basis that tr trigger uh, the pragmatic inferences. So they are uh, uh, inseparable, actually. So uh, dynamic semantics is something that was invented uh, mainly uh, following Kampf. Uh, uh, and uh, Aaron Heim uh, work in the early 80s. And it's a, it's, it's a way to deal with those typical phenomena of pragmatic intrusion, such as anaphora, the axis, ellipsis, presupposition, uh, etc. And uh, uh, the standard approach in semantics consists to, uh, in mapping sentences or natural language sentences to truth conditions. And uh, uh, usually you do that uh, using a representation of the, uh, of the, of the semantic content, uh, such as formula. In, uh, so that's, uh, but you, you don't need to use the formula. For instance, Montague uh, wrote a very influential paper in 73 showing that you, you, can, you can really uh, 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 do model theory directly to a, on a non-trivial part of English and you don't need formula to represent what the, the meaning is. You can interpret those directly on the, on the model. But uh, it's convenient to use formula. And then uh, uh, dynamic semantics is really a, a paradigm shift for, um, in, in meaning theory because uh, uh, it, it considered that uh, the meaning of something is, is not the truth condition, uh, is the context change potential. So you've got always a context Maybe it's, uh, it's a null context, there is nothing in the context, but you always have a context. And meaning 
is actually a function from context to context. So uh, when you, you ask yourself what the meaning of this sentence, the, the real question you ask is what this uh, uh, sentence when uttered does to the context. What's the new context after the entrance of the, uh, of the sentence? So here, language use it at the core of semantics. So the, the old fashioned uh, division saying that you've got pragmatics when language is used and semantic is with, without respect to use, that, that's, that's over. We are we're not, no longer into this because language use is uh, extremely relevant to uh, 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 determining uh, semantic context. So <clears throat> the most influential uh, 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 dynamic semantics is Kant's discourse representation theory, or DRT for short, and the ma main idea is twofold. First, you, 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 you conceptually separate the introduction of a discourse referent and uh, uh, the, the binding of the quantifiers. So uh, in, in the usual way of doing semantics, when you've got a, a discourse referent introduced, it's always in the scope of a quantifier. Uh, and here, you just separate both operations. And then you provide a, a, a dependency structure, which is, is just a way to, to know what are the, uh, it's a fine-grained way to know what are the discourse reference available uh, when you, did, you need to assign a reference to some term. Uh, and, and it's, well, I won't go into details, but the, the, the idea is that if you want to, to get anaphora correctly, for instance, uh, you need to have a, a, such a fine-grained notion of what is available. And uh, so uh, if you have an indefinite noun phrase, like a man, for instance, uh, uh, it behaves as though they introduce something like free variables rather than existential quantifiers with a, a determinate nuclear scope. So that in dynamic semantics achieve such effect, like allowing correct binding for anaphora by making the assignment function which maps free variables to individual parts of the contents of the discourse. So uh, I think there's a typo, typo here, but the, the idea, the main idea, and that's why I use this, uh, this quote, is that uh, uh, the way you link the discourse referent to the word is a part of what you say. And I think this is extremely relevant for an Ayavada. So uh, that's, that's the, the idea. That, uh, the discourse referent uh, are available in your representation of meaning for a contextual definition of their semantic value. You don't have a, 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 a predetermined theory of what are the discourse reference. Uh, the dis uh, what they are is part of what you say when you say something. So, existential presupposition. So, for presupposition, I, I think you're all uh, acquainted with the phenomenon, but just for uh, uh, memory, so you, uh, the, the Example is from Russell, it's extremely well known, the King of France is bold, and uh, you notice that uh, if I say the King of France is bold, uh, obviously I presuppose that there is a unique King of France. If uh, there is no King of France, my sentence, the King of France is bold, is just meaningless, uh, uh, or it has no truth value to say it uh, in those terms. So uh, it's important to, 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 to note also that, for instance, bold is not a term that is carrying an existential presupposition. There, there is no presupposition attached to bold here. But to the king of France, uh, there is one. So the usual way to uh, dis describe the, the, the meaning of uh, an indefinite noun phrase, like a uh, definite description like the king of France, it, is to write down a formula like this that say, there is a, there, there's one guy and this guy is the king of France as if there is any other guy that is the king of France, this other guy is the same as the first. So that's, that's, that's good, but it says that there is exactly one king of France in the universe, which is uh, maybe good news for the king of France, but if you want to, to, to say the pot and you use that, you will end up saying that there is exactly one pot in the universe, which may not be a very good news for your, your semantics, but because Probably it's not what you want to say. So uh, how do you do that? Uh, in DRT, uh, you, you do it like that. So uh, the, uh, mainly what you, uh, this arrow, you hear me? Okay. And this arrow uh, is, it represents the function. So this is the way you represent the context. You've got the first list, and in, this is a list of discourse reference, and a second list, and those are conditions, saying what happens to those discourse reference. And this is, so an arbitrary context, the dots are just uh, uh, whatever, 
And uh, uh, if uh, I have to interpret the pot, I go from, to, from whatever to whatever plus a new guy, x, and two conditions on the guy. The first condition is that the guy is a pot, which obviously, and the second condition is that c predicates. And what, 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 what does the c mean? Uh, uh, I just add, uh, because it's important because for the di difference between a, a definite and indefinite description, the is a definite description, so you've got extra rules that say you have to look in the, the, the guys that were already there for the guy that is the pot you're talking about. And this is extremely important because when, you're, uh, when, when you, uh, you, you, you say, the pot, uh, give me the pot, for instance, uh, the, 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 the people hearing you will have to try what pot you're talking about and you presuppose that it's an available and salient uh, relevant pot that you can say it's the one, so it's a pot already available. So, about C. Uh, here's what comes say about this C predicate. The contextual predicate C must, as a term, contextual implies, be recovered from the context in which the description is used. The C imposes on the context a constraint which is reminiscent of those imp imposed by anaphoric pronouns. The predicate C is to be identified with the is antecedent and the id identification should fit the interpretation of the discourse as a whole. More specifically, it should enable the interpreter to see the contextualized existence and uniqueness presupposition as fulfilled. So the idea is that when, when I say uh, uh, a pot, for instance, or the pot in the uh, next slide is about uh, uh, the, the indefinite description, so it's the same when I say a pot, for instance, they, in the content, if I want to give an adequate representation of the meaning of what I say when I say a pot, there is a predicate in, the, in this that will tell me what do I mean by pot? What, what, kind, of, what, what kind of reference, discourse reference is that I'm talking about? Uh, so uh, you, when, when you, you don't want to have the uniqueness uh, constraints, you introduce a, a new predicate, I, I put E there, uh, which is like C, but just without uniqueness. Because if I say a pot, I'm not uh, presupposing that there is just one. It, it may be various one. So that's the hypothesis that we're working un un under for, for this paper is this one, that the Nayavada is precisely, the, a great deal of the Nayavada is a theory of about, about C and E predicates. And more generally, uh, a set of guidelines for construing uh, an adequate representation of the meaning of an uttered sentence. And uh, uh, I, I was so, as I told you, I'm not Sanskritist, so I, 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 I had uh, this uh, impression that uh, naya means uh, viewpoint because every everybody says that. And then I went to Monier Williams and I asked for naya, and it gave me like uh, 10, 10 meanings, and none of that was viewpoint at all. And, and it has to do with leadership, guidance, and uh, expertise in doing something. So I had this impression that maybe Naya also means uh, like guidelines, like a orientation to do right, the right thing or something like that. And uh, this, this was my, uh, uh, obviously, they, they, I'm sure there are very, very good reasons to translate it as viewpoint. And there's no, no doubt about that. But uh, for me, it was convenient to see it like a, a guideline because I, what I think Naya are, uh, at least in part, is this pragmatic uh, uh, advice or guidelines to how to retrieve the meaning when some, someone says something to you, how to, how to understand what the, the people are saying. So uh, uh, now I will try to, to look at the uh, uh, interesting, or at least interesting for me, uh, 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 natural language phenomena that, that corresponds to what happens in a, all those uh, Nayas. So the, uh, the those assumption is that uh, the the domain in which you will interpret the discourse reference is given by the pramana theory. It, it's uh, uh, pramana are the, those criteria for correct uh, uh, cognition, and so uh, by uh, sound or correct cognition you grasp uh, uh, individuals uh, things, and those things are uh, if you take them as a whole uh, the domain in which you will interpret discourse. And the role of the Naya so is to provide a, a guide to uh, uh, construe correctly the meaning uh, of uh, an utterance in a given context and make sure, uh, I think it's important at least for with respect to what Prabhachandra says, for instance, when he presents the Naya, make sure that you can always interpret uh, uh, the meaning of the terms with uh, object of sound cognition. 
So you, you don't want to end up with a uh, non-existent object or, or incognizable object or contradictory object or anything like that. Um, so uh, when, when the Naya theory should also uh, give to the, the, the student of it, for instance, uh, uh, contextual factors uh, allowing the interpreter to choose the right Naya. You, you, so someone says something and which Naya will, will I use to interpret uh, what people are saying? And uh, one of the main factors, obviously, is the cultural or philosophical background of the, 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 the utterer, the, the speaker. Uh, that's why you've got systematic uh, uh, analogies or uh, connections between uh, each Naya and school of thought. Because yeah, if a Buddhist is talking, then use, the, uh, for instance, the false Naya. It's because usually they are viewing the world this way, so it's, it's a good guide. Uh, so let's look at the first Naigama. And it says that terms should be uh, interpreted either as referring to particular or as a universal, so that, not, that which doesn't go in a unique way. And Prachandra proposed two characterizations of uh, linguistic phenomena Night Gamma fruitfully applies to. First, you've got intention declaration. So uh, you ask to someone, uh, what, what, what are you doing? I, I'm, I'm cutting a cord of wood. But the guy is just with his ax and he, he cut no wood. So the problem is that uh, uh, you grasp the meaning, you understand what the guy says, and there is no cord available in, in, in the context. Uh, you know, there are, so you need a, a universal to account for the fact that you grasp the meaning of what is said, and uh, while there is no available particular, at the same time, the utterance is actually about a particular, so you really need uh, uh, to be able to interpret using both universals and particular to, to, to uh, make sense out of declaration of intentions and everything that uh, um, concerns something which is not actually present. Second uh, way of characterizing, uh, uh, Prachandra told uh, as this uh, example, this person is happy, you can always say uh, happiness is what the, the person has. So terms are ambivalent in the sense that uh, uh, you, you can switch them syntactically and uh, uh, you've got sentences that are, have the same felicity conditions. You, you can say them uh, felicitously in the same conditions, but the, the meaning is not the same. So uh, my understanding of the, uh, of, of the reason why Prabhachandra used this example and this switch is that uh, uh, if what is carrying the uh, existential presupposition in, in a predication like that is the subject, and you, you've got this same felicity condition for uh, uh, this person is happy and happiness is what this person have, you need in your domain to have both universal and particular. So that's Nagama. Then Samgraha is the, uh, it's the rule that forces all referent, uh, the reference of all existential presupposition to be typed as universal. So according to Prarashandra, this can be done in two ways. You've got the ultimate universal, and uh, uh, according to this, uh, this rule, there is actually only one discourse referent. It's always the same, and you can call it being, for instance. So everything you say is about being, uh, just being. So uh, uh, when, when you write the semantic representation of a, a simple sentence like the, the pot is red, you need heavy rewriting to, 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 to really get to what it means. And what it means but may be understood such a, uh, in, in such a, a gloss uh, like, like that, the reality is such that the pot is red. And such that the pot is red is a predicate, it's a condition. So you've got reality and this is the, uh, the, the discourse reference. This car is an existential presupposition. And uh, such as the pot is red is just a condition, it's, just, it's a predicate, so you don't have any existential presupposition about that. So uh, actually everything you say is just about, uh, about one discourse referent. Then you've got uh, the intermediate universal where uh, uh, the rewriting is lighter. So you've got those universal, like uh, for instance in Plato's metaphysics. Uh, so uh, pot is associated to potness and red to redness and everything. And then you, you, you can understand this pot is red, for instance, or the pot is red, like potness and red, redness co-occur. So you've got a same locus for two, uh, two uh, universal. And potness and redness actually carry uh, existential presupposition, but uh, co-occurrence is just a condition, so you don't have uh, existential presupposition. Or you, are, you, you don't need to have a co-occurrence as uh, something that uh, the discourse refers to. Then we have a Hara. Uh, this is, 
So it's a rule that provides ways to interpret discourse in its most common exception. Uh, at least in what I read, uh, what, uh, one of the main focus uh, uh, with Vyavarahara is common practice, the layman practice. So uh, the, the idea is to, uh, um, to be able to grasp the, uh, the more common usage of uh, language. And it seems to be mainly con concerned with the way one may compose universal to get a semantic value of a particular. So Anne uh, said things about that also. So uh, universal uh, in, in that respect are not collection, like in the collective viewpoint where uh, you use our ability to neglect, uh, to disregard uh, small differences to collect uh, uh, all the chairs into just chair chairness. Uh, you use universal as a differentiator. So, uh, for instance, the blue book. Uh, fetch me a book. Which book? The blue one. So, uh, blue here is uh, universal. That that that's used as a differentiator to pick up one single uh, book, which is the one you need. And um, the, the 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 meaning of a blue book may be in this respect understood as uh, the individual among the books, which is blue. And it's uh, particularly interesting to look at that, at it like that, that way because uh, blue is then, the meaning of blue is then uh, in the context of book. Uh, blue here depends on what book means. And for blue books, it's not very important, but if I say a small planet, for instance, uh, it would be, I think, a mistake that to infer from what I say that I'm saying that there is a, a small thing, which is a planet, or uh, there is something which is both a planet and small, because a small planet is is not a small object. Uh, it's a very big five one. Five minutes are remaining. Five. five. Yeah. yeah, that's ooh, <laughs> that's fresh. Uh, uh, interestingly, uh, uh, when uh, Pravashandra presents Vyavahara, he says also that uh, one of the problems with that, with the, one of the defects associated with the viewpoint with the Naya, is uh, uh, if you take it at face value, you can, you can compound meanings and yield uh, uh, unsound results. For instance, you can say sky lotus. So it would be uh, uh, in the context of a lotus, something which grows in the sky and there is no something as sky lotus, so you don't want to, uh, to allow uh, uh, unbounded meaning compositions. And this is, uh, at least I think that Prarashana has this kind of thing in mind. Uh, Raju Sutra is missing Shabda. This is, uh, 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 we enter in the domain of those uh, word um, uh, bound uh, viewpoints. And uh, uh, the, the idea of Shabda is to uh, retrieve the proper reference by following li linguistic convention alone. So the idea is that uh, uh, linguistic terms are uh, mainly uh, receive sem uh, semantic value out of convention. And uh, uh, just for the sake of uh, uh, understanding what, what I see in the three last, uh, in, the, in the embedding or the, the, the relation between the three last Naya, I will focus on proper names. And uh, uh, the Shabda rule strongly reminds of the, the quotation theory of proper names. So you've got Indra, and that's, that's the typical Prabhupada example for uh, the, the three last uh, uh, Naya. And uh, the, the, the semantic value of Indra is uh, in the quotation theory of proper names, like uh, you, 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 you find it in Gertz, for instance. Uh, uh, it's the individual name Indra. And the quotation here is important because this is your, your link with uh, linguistic practices. Whoops. Uh, this is the, your link with uh, linguistic practices. The quotation all is just a link with the, uh, what uh, Kripke would call the initial baptism. The, uh, when society decided that this god will be called Indra, for instance. So you go to uh, Samaviruda, uh, uh, dropping the quotation. The, uh, the, the, this uh, Naya insists on the compositional aspect of, uh, of uh, uh, the building of uh, um, name meaning. Uh, it's the subject matter of what uh, Bronco's called uh, semantic etymology. And uh, we can denote uh, uh, Indra bars uh, as the, uh, the result of, uh, of semantic and etymological analysis of what Indra, name Indra means. And, and then you, you get this uh, semantic value for uh, Indra. Indra is the individual that is Indra. And, and this is a set of conditions that you can retrieve by uh, uh, this uh, uh, etymolo semantic and etymological analysis. So uh, importantly, that's uh, uh, um, uh, a note, uh, it will typically yield dispositional predicates. Like uh, 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 the, 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 
the one who destroys uh, citadels, for instance, uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it may be understood as a, pre uh, a dispositional predicate. Uh, that, that, that is, I, I can destroy citadels. It's not saying that I'm doing it now, and that's uh, uh, important to see the difference with Evan Buta because the, the last Naya is uh, uh, actually the same. You just add one operator, which is uh, actually the operator saying that uh, uh, the, the meaning that you retrieve by analysis of what Indra means, uh, you add that actually is doing this. And this will give you uh, uh, a semantic representation of the meaning of uh, uh, a name like Indra. So uh, I've got at least uh, two open problems in the way I, I try to understand all this. Uh, the first is, uh, uh, it seems, for instance, in uh, Piotr's uh, presentation of the uh, Nayavada, that uh, uh, several authors insist on this idea of uh, uh, an embedding. We've been uh, uh, un, uh, described that also, this idea that uh, uh, each viewpoint is a restriction on the previous one. And it, uh, in, in what I presented, it's not obvious how, how you could do that for the seven at once. Uh, you can do that for the... the, 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 the uh, two, three, four, it's easy. You can do that for uh, uh, five, six, seven, it's easy. But uh, to go from one to seven in one uh, set of uh, restricting condition, it's uh, really far from obvious. And uh, uh, another question, maybe you know that, so I will start by asking you questions. <laughs> Uh, uh, is that, uh, is it possible, uh, did, did any author uh, consider the possibility that when uh, interpreting one uh, given single utterance, you may apply uh, simultaneously various nayas? Uh, because it seems that uh, uh, you may, for instance, use uh, one of the three lasts and one of the three firsts at the same time to uh, calculate or uh, determine the, the semantic uh, representation of the, the meaning of uh, an utterance. So that's, that's my uh, take on Naya. Thanks.